Hey, Cottage Coach Adam Holman here. If you know me, you know I spend a lot of time outdoors. Whether I'm camping with my family or fishing in my top secret spot, there's nowhere I'd rather be than in the wild. Sadly, we all have to head home at some point, and I'm pretty sure the mosquitoes have put a homing device on me, because sometimes they can be just as annoying in my backyard. So, when I'm in the city, I use the off backyard mosquito lamp. Whether I'm barbecuing my breakfast or having dinner with my family, I know it will keep the mosquitoes away for up to six hours. Which means I never have to head inside again. Hi, I'm Michelle Kelly, Editor-in-Chief of Cottage Life magazine. In this episode, we explore race and the cottage experience, decode owl calls, and reflect on the power of tradition. This is the Cottage Life podcast, where every day is the weekend. Can I get honest, uncomfortably honest? Cottaging is very white. That's something we wanted to address when we asked journalist Elamine Abdul Mahmoud to explore race and the Canadian cottage experience for cottage life. His thoughtful article, Breaking the Color Code, which came out in the spring 2019 issue of the magazine, was recently nominated for a National Magazine Award. When the piece came out last year, it caused some controversy among our readers. I get it. It's a sensitive and complex issue, and it's a topic I've been wanting to unpack further with Elamine for the podcast. Hi, Elamine. Hey, how's it going? Thanks so much for being here. I thought uh, before we begin, you could tell us a little bit about your first cottaging experience. Sure. Um, I wrote a little bit about that in the piece, and that's, uh, you know, when I was 18 and uh, I was attending Queen's University, um, a, a friend said, hey, you, you guys, she invited a bunch of us and said, do you want to come to my family's cottage, um, which is in the, in the Thousand Islands? And uh, my thought was, my first thought was, sure, and my second thought was, what is a cottage? And kind of, you know, getting this nice idea that it's a, a secondary property that isn't the first home that this family owns, that it's a home that is specifically exists for leisure. Um, I, was, I was a bit flabbergasted by that. And then more shocked when we showed up uh, and discovered that they have a whole island to themselves. Um, now, since then, I've learned that, you know, not all cottages are separate, you know, specific islands that someone owns. But it was still foreign to me, this idea that you would um, have a specific place where you go to relax that is just like a second home that isn't the initial place that you live in. Right. And so should be clear, you were born in Sudan and came here when you were quite young, right? So this was not something that goes on in Sudan, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I, I was 12 years old when I came to Canada from Sudan. And so... Like your house is just where you live. That it was just not a thing that you'd have a second place. It's just for um, more relaxing. Right, hanging out, having fun, not working exactly. Yeah. So one thing that you talk about in the article, you spoke to a lot of researchers who've who've been exploring this topic for a long time, and and one of them noted that uh, quote race has a huge part to play in terms of who goes to the cottage. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that a bit? Sure. That was uh, that comes from uh, from from Dr. Dr. Jacqueline Scott, who's a PhD student um, at the University of Toronto, and her research focuses on race in the wilderness. So she spends a lot of time researching the relationship between black people and going outdoors. Um, and so she kind of gives this explanation that in order to be comfortable outdoors, um, you have to kind of buy into a certain story, at least um, here in Canada, the story that the white settlers came and found this unforgiving, amazing landscape, and then they claim victory over it and tamed it, that's the beginning of this idea of this super romantic, um, the outdoors is a place for us to relax. Whereas that's not, may, may not be necessarily the case for a lot of people of color. You know, the outdoors tend to be like really close to um, smaller towns where um, people are, might be like less exposed to diversity and because of that uh, might have different attitudes about it. So immigrants, people of color might not necessarily buy into that myth. For that idea. Right. Okay. So you also say in this story, um, your quote is, as an immigrant, it's not easy to see myself in the story of cottaging. Mm -hmm. What did you mean by that? And what are some of the barriers that immigrants and people of color face on entering cottage culture? Well, right away, you know, you get into this idea that uh, my family um, and a lot of other immigrant families, their first thought when they come to this country is to sort of establish this foundation. 
right? Um, one of the people that I spoke to is Nadia, who does own a cottage. And she talked about how her family went through quite a bit of hardship and moved a few times in order to get to Canada. So when they got here, they weren't necessarily thinking about leisure. For them, a victory is, is, is simply laying down a foundation of stability, maybe buying a home, um, making sure their kids get a decent education. It doesn't go as far as, you know, thinking about a property where to relax. Um, and so and, and I'm very much connected with with her parents' idea because my parents, for them, like the thing that they worked the hardest towards uh, was making sure that, you know, I got a decent education and I had a roof over my head. They, that, that didn't really extend much further beyond to like their enjoyment of it. So I just didn't have access to it. I, it's very hard to to sort of be what you can't see in a sense. And if you don't know a lot of um, other um, immigrants or friends of color who, who, who own cottages, it just becomes like a bit of a harder story to see yourself in, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole thing about representation. It, it does mm -hmm. really matter. Yeah, of course. You talk about how um, you get the look when you're in, in cottage country, yes. um, when you sometimes go to cottage country towns and uh, how you feel that people are looking at you. And then the really the thing that hit me like a ton of bricks is how you said that you can blunt the look by wearing a tragically hip hat. Yeah. Yes. I thought that was so interesting. So can you just explain a little bit more about what the look is and how you sort of mitigate it that way? I mean, the, the look, and I think it's a look that's, you know, familiar to a lot of uh, people of color who grow up in, in, in dominantly white spaces is this look of like, Hey, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with, with you or, or, or who you are, or I haven't seen a lot of people who look like you. Um, it's not necessarily a hostile look, but it is an uncomfortable one. It's, um, it's, it's, it's more, um, it's more like, I'm a little curious how you ended up here, which the implications of which are, you don't necessarily belong here. Now I grew up, I grew up in Kingston after my family moved to Canada. So the look was a, was a common occurrence. It's something that happened a lot to me. And when you're, when you're a person of color outside of a lot of, you know, any major city, um, it's something that you kind of just get used to. People do a double take, be like, Hey, you're this, this place is mostly white and you're not white. Um, I, uh, I, I wrote that line about the tragic hood because it's true because I like people feel a, a kinship with me. That's a little bit, you know, um, constructed from seeing the tragically hip hat. I'm a big fan of the hip, but the fact that that's our access point for finding some kind of commonality and not the fact that we're sharing a physical space is pretty striking to me. Um, and, and Nadia, the person, has, one of the people I spoke to in the piece, said like she's very aware of the feeling of being noticed. Like one of the things that that first popped out to her was like, it doesn't really happen in her sort of cottage community, but when she goes into town to get supplies or goes into um, the nearest big city to just like um, go to the store or something, she notices immediately that people are aware that she's not white. Um, and, that's, and that's something that could really shape your experience, it, you know, like... For her, and, and for me for that matter, um, that's a part of my narrative of going to the cottage. It's like sometimes I'm going to get that look, that look of discomfort. I've heard this from other people of color as well. I think it's it's a really common thing. And again, uh, I think that white cottagers probably don't consider that at all, um, you know, which mm -hmm. is part of what we were really wanting to do with this piece is to have your perspective be considered um, by those people. Mm -hmm. what, one thing that uh, I would note is that like, you know, for me, it's a tragically hip hat that helps with the situation. For Nadia, like she, she mentions that, uh, you know, in the first few weeks of owning a cottage, um, when she introduced herself to, to her neighbors, um, as soon as her neighbors realized that, you know, they're, they're all professionals, their kids go to the same universities, that was her version of, of the tragically hip hat, of some kind of blunting of that look. Like, all of a sudden, we're not strangers because we have this kind of thing in common. But the, the, the first the first few assumptions were people doing these double takes and say, hey, who just moved into this neighborhood? So there, there are different, you know, mechanisms for for communicating that familiarity. Um, it just it's like work that has to be done every time. Yeah, it's kind of a whole separate but absolutely related article about how class changes yeah. um, yes. in these in these scenarios, for sure, how it changes things. I wanted to talk a little bit about Prish Jain, who is someone that we've known um, through the magazine for quite a while. He's an architect based in Toronto, and he has a family cottage up in Halliburton. And I, I first spoke to him about a story on his cottage, actually, and um, 
he was telling me something that, again, really struck me. Uh, he's from India. His family is from India. And uh, he built this cottage with his brothers, and they have a very large family, and they all use the space together. And he said how it was interesting to him that there were not more people of color and more immigrants in cottage country because the lifestyle of cottaging is very multi-generational. And that mm-hmm. is very common in India. You live with your parents. You live with your siblings, you know, all through life. And how that's, in fact, what cottaging is, too. And I, I found that really interesting. Yeah, that was a that was a really striking thing that Pierce said because uh, I, I didn't really have um, the context for what the cottage meant to him until he explained that. Um, you know, like him sort of explaining the fact that uh, he, they can't do the multi-generational living at, in the city where the spaces are much more cramped, but they can make the cottage a space that does that for them. And I think that's like, one, a really creative interpretation of what the cottage is. And two, the smile and the serenity we talked over the phone and the smile of the serenity that comes over him as he talks about the fact that, you know, like three brothers, there's a total of nine children and his parents also um, share the space. Um, like that sounds so transformational to me that I sort of immediately began to reframe what the cottage is. That's how powerful his story was. Yeah, he's a very thoughtful and interesting guy for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about how our readers reacted to this story. Um, yes. It, it was surprising and it wasn't, I suppose, to me. We, we anticipated there'd be a lot of discussion. And in fact, that was the reason we did it. But one thing that kept coming back, I had a really great chat with a woman in, in person when I met her at the Cottage Life show last spring, shortly after the article came out. And she said to me, you know, I love your magazine. I, I think it's so wonderful. And I I have to say, though, I read that article and I felt like you were telling me that I'm a racist. Mm. And I thought, I thought, what? That's not what we were telling you at all. We were telling you the experiences of one person and some other people that he's talked to that have thought deeply about this. Um, So I said, well, why don't you believe him? And she said, it's not that I don't believe him. It's just that, you know, I'm very welcoming of people of color. And it was a really interesting conversation. And I wondered, you know, what you would have said to her in that moment. Um, and how you would have reacted, you know, right. that she was saying, I felt like you called me racist. That's a really interesting framing of it, because when I think about the article, I actually try to, you know, I'm trying to, like, figure out a place where that feeling might have come up. Um, because hopefully what the article did was point out that there are things about cottaging as a, as a, as a construct and as an institution that create barriers for people of color. But that's not an individual problem. That's not a problem for any individual sort of, you know, cottage owner to fix. Um, it's it's a larger problem with the with 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 sort of the narrative that we have about the outdoors and the narratives that we have um, about about uh, about cottaging. But it, it has nothing to do with any kind of individual owner. Certainly, the idea of the look coming from other cottage owners, um, you know. It's, I, I would say it's everybody's job to figure out how they're reacting to people of color in their space, um, to in, in that particular space. But like, I don't know if that means I'm accusing someone of being racist. I would say that I'm certainly inviting that person to think more thoughtfully about the space that they occupy, um, maybe think more thoughtfully about how they behave in, in cottage country versus how they do in the city. Um, and how that's different, if it is different. But I think it's just more more so just an invitation to reflect more than anything else. That is what I wish I'd said to her. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I said some version of that. It, yeah. To me, the, the thing that struck me was that when when I was growing up, you know, through the 80s and 90s, and this woman was, you know, for sure 20 years older than me, it, I was really taught you know, to not be racist meant we don't see race. We don't, there are no differences. We're of the human race. And I think in the broader culture since, we've sort of shifted our thinking around that. And and I have for sure, because I think if you don't see the differences, then you also don't see the problems that exist that, you know, you were just talking about that are more systemic. Exactly. that, That are based on our differences. So in order to validate those problems, um, you have to recognize that they exist. So I think that was a really, again, I think if we can get around that, you know, with some of our readers and and that's, you know, a lot of the conversations we've had, which has been great. I mean, I can't tell you enough how I think you really have made a difference to their thinking and done exactly what you had just said. It's an invitation to reflect and for sure there's been reflection. So 
I guess I'll, 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 you know, a little bit deeper into that. I, I'd say going forward, what can cottagers and, and not just cottagers, Canadians in general, what can they do to make our culture more accepting to immigrant communities? I, I think uh, it begins with just that reflection. You know, um, it's not about it's not about any kind of individual action that someone can take. It's about a general awareness of these systemic forces and also your place in them. You know, um, noticing your the street that your cottage is on you know and and how many non-white families there are is like a good start just realizing that like and articulating um that you are in a space that is dominated by by more white people than not than non-white people is just like a helpful start because when these things go unnoticed and unnamed they just kind of become assumptions you know mm-hmm. and, and, and over time that becomes baked into the structure right. and so it just begins with noticing um and, and it's not a you know it's not a racist observation to notice. It's just like just look around you and notice. Right, um, Elamine. It's just wonderful to talk to you about this and to get your perspective. And um, I look forward to seeing more of your work in the magazine. And thanks so much for chatting with me today. Well, thank you so much for thank you so much for having me on the podcast. But also thank you so much for you know wanting to explore this topic um, in the magazine. I think when we were starting to have that conversation, um, my first thought was boy, I don't know how your readership is going to react to wanting to broach the subject. So I'm just so glad that you did it. I'm so glad that you had the courage to do it. Oh, thanks. No, we're glad to, 100%. Okay, so I have a confession. I can't recall ever seeing an owl in the wild, but I love how regal they are, and I'd love to experience one in nature. Liam Bobechko is here with more Nature Sounds and to give me some tips on how I might end my wild owl drought. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Michelle. I'm really excited to talk about owls today. They're actually a perfect bird to talk about on the podcast because we're much more likely to hear one than to see one. So what have you got for us today? We've got two owls that are common across Canada, the barred owl and the great horned owl. They definitely have distinct calls, and I'm going to play them back to back for you. They sound so cool, right? And pretty distinct from each other. Even still, it can be hard to tell them apart. But I have an easy way for you to remember. There are cute little mnemonics for each one. Oh, please share. The barred owl says, Who, who, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? And the great horned owl says, Who's awake? Me too. (laughs) I like that a lot. Let's play them again so we can listen for those words this time. Sure. Okay, so here's the barred owl. And again, we're listening for who, who, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? And now the great horned owl. And we're listening for who's awake? Me too. Could you make out the words that time? I actually could make out the words. So cool. I I hear those words in their call, but I'm pretty sure that's not what they're actually saying. What are they saying? (laughs) No, that's not what they're saying. I talked to Kathy Jones at Bird Studies Canada to find out what they are saying in owl language. She said that owls' calls are their main form of communication. They use them to display their territory, communicate with each other, and to talk to their young. Sort of the way we say, hey, you. And both males and females make these calls. Okay, so what is my best shot at actually hearing these calls when I'm in the wilderness? Well, I was surprised about this because I've definitely heard the barred owl anyway in the summer. But Kathy said you're most likely to hear it during breeding season. And for the barred owl, that's early spring. And for the great horned owl, she said to listen in February. Owls are most active just after sunset and for a short period before sunrise. So try listening on a clear evening. When it's a little colder, their calls carry well. Pairs will sing a duet one or two months before their eggs are laid, and then most birds get quiet when they have chicks so that predators don't find the nest. And, get this, the most dangerous predator for the barred owl is the great horned owl, which eats eggs, young birds, and occasionally even adults. Huh. So, to sum up, great horned owl with the who's awake, me too call preys on the who, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all owl. Is that right? Yeah. Now, it's not the only thing on their late night menu, but yeah, sometimes I guess it's an owl eat owl world. (laughs) Oh, very clever. (laughs) 
So tell me, are there tricks to finding owls? Well, the folks at Bird Studies Canada really don't encourage looking for owls because they're very sensitive to disturbance, and once found, everyone wants to see them. If you do happen upon an owl nest, Kathy recommends that you watch it from a distance so that the owls can continue their normal behaviors. Oh, okay, so that's good to know. Is there anything else you want to tell us about owls? So owls are actually indicator species. So if they're there, it's a sign that the forest is healthy. If you want to learn more about nocturnal owl surveys and other programs to monitor bird populations in Canada, and to find out whether they're looking for volunteers in your area, visit birdscanada.org. That sounds like a pretty great way to spend your time at the cottage. Thanks, Leanne. Thanks, Michelle. I always thought birds were cool, but I wasn't out there with a pair of binoculars and a dog-eared field guide. But ever since this whole sheltering-in-place thing started, there seemed to be more birds around than ever, even in the city. And I have to admit, I've become kind of obsessed with them. Spotting new birds has led to a lot of excitement on my family's morning walks. We're noticing all sorts of new birds that we've never noticed before. Goldfinches and catbirds, and my son even saw a beautiful little indigo bunting a few weeks ago. In my own quest to see one myself, I'm going to visit some local parks. It's my mission to find it before the summer comes to an end. There's just one problem. Sitting stone still in nature will make me a bullseye for mosquitoes. So I need a good bug spray to keep me happy, like off deep free mosquito repellent. It works for up to five hours, isn't greasy or oily like some of the other repellents, and it's safe for the whole family six months and up. Plus, it works well over my clothes and it's safe to use around plastics. So now I can focus on finding that gorgeous little blue bird instead of scaring it away by swatting and itching. Over the 32-year history of Cottage Life magazine, we've been so lucky to have some of Canada's most distinguished writers reflect on life at the cottage. This essay by Stephen Marsh was originally published in the early summer 2017 issue of Cottage Life. On the Power of Tradition is read by Pedro Mendez. Once every summer, I climb Haling Peak. The mountain looms over my mother's place in Canmore, Alberta, and climbing it is a ritual. The Rocky Mountains are too harsh for anything that might be called a cabin or a cottage elsewhere in the country, and nature is not so soft there that you may bask in it. But the purifying truth of the wilderness is closer, more difficult, and more intimate. You just have to walk up to it. The path from the house to the mountain takes you past the turquoise grassy lakes, which are knotted against glorious limestone climbing walls in the pass from town. I always pause at the pictograph in the pass, an icon left there by an unknown people unknown thousands of years ago, a man holding up an ochre circle. The real work of the nearly 8,000-foot climb starts soon after. The trail on the backside of the mountain is a well-maintained but steep and unforgiving series of switchbacks followed by a few hundred meters of scramble. The air thins as the mountain rises, and with it, the difficulty thickens. For decades, Haling Peak was known as Chinaman's Peak. In 1998, the name was changed, for obvious reasons. Haling Peak is a much better name, not just because it's less offensive, but also because it is the name of a man with a story. In 1896, the friends of a 28-year-old Chinese-Canadian cook named Ha Ling bet him 50 bucks that he couldn't climb the mountain that now bears his name in the span of 10 hours. He did it in five and planted a flag at the top for proof. The guys who bet him didn't believe his story and couldn't see the flag, so the next day they all climbed the mountain together and found the flag right where Ha Ling had planted it. Soon, the editors of the Medicine Hat News heard about the feat and suggested Ha Ling Peak as the name. 19th century Canadians changed it, out of habit, to the slur. They didn't know or want to know who Ha Ling was. They knew what a Chinaman was. Ten hours is about as long as it takes me to climb the mountain. Five would be a stretch for sure. But the climb is worth it. The view from the top is glorious. On the north side, the town. To the south, Goat Range Provincial Park. The scale of geologic time makes the preoccupations of daily business seem like what they are, mere busyness. The glory of the mountains is that the more you stand in them, the less human differences in time or in culture matter. 
Canada is not without the crimes that have consumed the history of other nations, but the land is our redemption. They took Holling's climb away from him twice, first because they couldn't believe it, and second because they wouldn't call the mountain by his name. But the climb was his climb, still, and everybody knew it, and eventually they gave it back to him. The way to move forward is to do just like Holling did, keep going up and plant a flag when you get there. Anyone who can climb that mountain belongs to that mountain. I belong to Holling, and he belongs to me. The name for our connection is Canada, I suppose, but our real connection is the climb. Nature is not there to comfort us. History is not there to fill us with pride. Both truths are obvious at Holling's Mountain, with the strenuousness of the hike and the tortured history of the name. But the climb gives the view from my mother's place meaning, which is why it's worth returning to again and again. Climbing the mountain changes the view from home. You know what you are looking at from down below only after you have been to the top. That's it for this episode. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe to the Cottage Life podcast for free wherever you get your podcasts. We'll have new episodes every Thursday throughout the summer, just in time for your drive up to the cottage. We'd love to hear from you. Post a review or email us with questions or comments at edit at cottagelife.com. And head to cottagelife.com to find out more about our magazine, our television shows, and our live events. This podcast is produced by Catherine Jun and me. I'm Michelle Kelly. I'll see you on the dock.